Hello everyone, today we reason briefly on the Janissaries, Suleiman the Munificent and the 1529 Siege of Vienna. Uh, we made several videos about the uh, events surrounding, let's say, the, uh, the, the, the Ottoman invasions, the Turkish wars, uh, broadly meant we started focusing a bit more on also the, the background to the 1689 siege uh, of Vienna, uh, and yet the 16th century, which we also never ventured for for other reason, and as say the medieval one, like for example, manualistically, right, deserves much more consideration. I will keep making videos on on this topic because that's also what we have to cover more more thoroughly at some point, and um, the. Um, Say the, the, the Sultan Selim the First, Yavuz, that is the terrible in turn, uh, had enlarged uh, at his death in 1520 his empire up to the uh, Near East, the African coasts. Right, this had brought eventually to the great um, inclusion also of Egypt, of say one of the most. Um, florid moments, in fact, in in the Ottoman um, expansionist phase, and the power was relatively young, at least in this exuberant um, expansion. And the 24-year-old son of Selim, that brought the name of the most splendid and wise among the biblical king, that is Solomon, uh, would continue on his father's footsteps, uh, that Suleiman, in fact, or Suleiman, I, I think, that the Westerners know, in fact, as the Magnificent, but that actually in the Turkish and Islamic tradition is um, ever more famous with uh, an even, in fact, more glorious um, title, that is Al-Kanuni, right? So the, the legislator, technically, properly from canon, which explicitly alludes, by the way, to Justinian's juridical legacy that the Ottomans, as you know, had collected together with the, the entire Roman imperial one as also one of the uh, uh, titles of the Ottoman emperors was, in fact, Roman emperor as well, and um, through which in fact, was affirmed the legitimate continuity between the R Roman and the Ottoman Empire, right? This was obvious, I would say, for a power of that size that wanted to affirm itself in uh, Europe and in the Mediterranean, um, and that was, in fact, coming to threaten the same northern Mediterranean shores, just like in the early Islamic uh, invasion, you see the Muslims essentially uh, taking on the, the same Roman legacy, essentially the early Islamic invasions in the Mediterranean were, were an accomplishment of, of Roman subjects rather than Arabs, specifically, think about the, the ships used to besiege the same Constantinople, the crews and so on, those were all Byzantine, f fundamentally, under Islamic um, rule. And Naturally, in Ottoman times, this was a very important point in which the sultanial diplomacy and political theory and practice um, were not to, to, to waver by any, uh, any degree, because on this depended the entire legitimacy of, of the empire as universal rule. So th there is no such thing like a universal rule um, and some other power. If you are a universal ruler, it's because you rule over the entire world, so anybody outside of you doesn't have any right, essentially even to exist as an independent reality, which is technically what the same Christians believed, aside from the different methods that they had come to, um, uh, to rule through and to prevail on, on the long run, and this is also, in fact, a very interesting side of the story. But of course the 16th century is a moment of great break, of great crisis in many ways, especially for the West in a way, but 
let's say the Islamic world was not more united, um, nor more successful in a in a in a broader sense, except perhaps for for example the the, the strictly speaking religious expansion, like the early modern age, uh, won much more. Uh, uh, converts, in fact, to, to Islam than to Christianity in the world, mostly in North Africa. In fact, um, through the Ottomans themselves, it had very interesting, in fact, um, proliferation, in, in um, especially in the, say, in the area of the savannas, let's say, between the, the Sahara and, and properly Central Africa. Um, that we will see that perhaps in another video. Um, in all this, uh, naturally, just imagine the, the scale of the empire, just extensionally speaking. It was cr incredibly complicated to rule, and you couldn't have but essentially an authoritarian way of doing it. Naturally, a way w which many of these peoples were already habituated to, but that were also dramatically different within themselves in the essence. And um, we'll see, in part, that the military success of the Ottomans was due to uh, as in the case of Constantinople itself, fundamentally the locals opening the gates to them. Um, the same is true again for the early Islamic invasions. So there is a deep crisis that had struck, especially the Orthodox world, um, and that uh, wouldn't make it to, to, to destroy, in fact, the Western Christendom that, on the contrary, was accelerating dramatically, and also the Ottomans had a a difficulty to cope with it. And that's why the siege, the, the 1529, actually also the 1699, uh, but sieges, let's say, of Vienna were so crucial because, um, you know, th there is a deep question of what were the Turks actually expecting to achieve by conquering um, the capital of Central Europe um, and with which perspectives for the eventual relation with, with the West that um, would have surely complicated enormously the matter, not that necessarily would have not advantaged the Ottomans with such a, an impressive feat, but that would have unlikely pushed the Ottoman force uh, further West uh, at the, you know, without uh, giving up the idea, for example, of keeping some broader ambitions in the East as well. So this is a bit the Ottoman dilemma, and every power had s some kind of uh, comparable issue regarding the the overstretching capacities and so on. Uh, but the Sultan, um, uh, let's say, in the in the Europe of the time, that was completely absorbed both by the conflict for the hegemony between the uh, Germanic Roman Emperor. And the uh, and King of Spain Charles V and the King of France Francis I, and the religious revolution, but also indeed the institutional and cultural one of the Reformation. Well, the role of Suleiman was deeply uh, fundamental because um, perhaps no other uh, Islamic dynasty has influenced influence so much uh, European history like in fact the one of, of the same Sulaim and the Ottomans uh, at large in this in this respect so it's obvious we should discuss very much what what Europe was at that time as well but we will do it in another video what what, what concerns us today is the fact that Sulaim owed great part of his achievements especially in land battles to the loyalty and the effectiveness of his um, beloved uh, chosen corps of infantry, the new guard, the Janissaries, in fact. Um, I made several videos about Ottoman warfare, so we talked about Janissaries as well. We'll, we'll keep talking about them because I, I don't think I made a video specifically about them. But understanding the nature of this core is also realizing what was the relation between the Sultan and his subjects. In, in this case, you know that the Janissaries were essentially uh, sensed as adoptive sons of the Sultan, personally speaking. And this kind of, uh, in fact, almost family, servile, kind of um, slave 
in interaction was was the entire was incarnating the entire ideology of, of of the empire in a way and also explaining the roots of the the empire is 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 complicated ideologically but speaking of the Janissary specifically well these had been instituted since the, the beginning essentially of the Ottoman expansion by the Sultan Orkan in uh, 1326 and as you as you know they would have remained the, the backbone of the Ottoman army the Imperial Ottoman army proper this is the important thing of the, of the story that this was an institutional core these weren't feudal lords as we have seen in the case of the Sipais and, uh, and or other ethnic auxiliary contingents, these were the Sultan. Um, and they would have remained in this role until 1826 when they were brutally exterminated and eventually suppressed uh, as a core, as you know. Um, so we have seen often also what the Dev Shirme was, so this forced levy of Christian boys, principally from Morea or Albania, and forcibly converted to Islam, quartered in specific, say, um, monasteries, barracks, because these were literal centers of indoctrination, um, the, the Janissaries were literally bred in an um, iron discipline, in, in a very Spartan way of life, right? They were obliged to celibacy and framed um, in, in this same uh, mystical religious brotherhood, the Tarikam Beka Bektashiya, um, which has um, a revealing, uh, in fact, um, ideological background. The, the Bektashi, whose um, legendary founder was um, Hai Bektash, that was um, immigrated in Anatolia from Khorasan in the first half of the 13th century, um, uh, and that constituted this brotherhood in the various monasteries, centuries between Anatolia and Rumelia, so in, in the heart eventually of the of the Ottoman uh, domination up to their suppression. In fact, in in the same year the Janissaries were um were 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 suppressed, were taken out, were essentially um in fact informing the same Janissary core as a sort of uh, filial uh, a spiritual filiation in in a way. In fact um, this order was essentially derived from the the Twelver Shia, from the Duodecimans. So it was something deeply different. It was basically the official cult of the Janissaries, and as you know, the Ottoman Empire was ultra-Orthodox Sunni. So um, this um, heresy, literally as a choice, is, is dramatically fascinating, because this was, in theory, the single most loyal um, uh, sultanial... Uh, army, right, and they were, these were people designed essentially to, uh, to, to, to die in battle, getting themselves massacred, no matter what, like a sort of immortal idea of their um, transfiguration, and exactly in this, in this vest, right, they were probably um, adopting uh, a religion that, as you know, had flourished mostly uh, in Iran, that was, by the way, with the Safavids, one of the major, I mean, not at the time, because the Safavids did not exist, but still from, you know, the Khorasan, the broader Persian area, so were the Shia, and so this also kind of nationally very different um, culture from from the one of, of the, probably of the Turks, telling the truth, and of the Ottomans, but, of course, there were some intersections, but was probably another thing, another story, and especially an heterodox movement against the orthodoxy that had already been the Sunni one of the uh, of the Mayas of the Abbasids, and later on adopted by, generally speaking, by the Turks, and as well by the Ottomans, uh, were competing with one another, and the reasons may be in fact the same, um, the same mindset that was required to such elite troops, right? The idea that um, they weren't, they were slaves, um, and the sultan slaves, so of course this was, this meant that were actually privileged, right, the, the Janissaries um, changed dramatically over time, also the Dev Shirme passed from a, a brutal um, kidnapping of, literally of, 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 of kids, 
from these brutal primitive populations of the Balkan interland and to essentially exploit the same, or to, to, to transform this in pure uh, extermination machines um, with all what it practically entailed. But as we've seen in the traditional um, view, probably also of the, the Balkan interland, that yes, before the Ottomans was westernized, but up to a certain point, meaning they, they, they some of were some of the most first brutal and savage populations in Europe, um, they still believed deeply in this sense of, you know, you have to pass through the, the lower ranks of the darkness of the wolf in order to, to eventually win the transfiguration. You know that in the Duodeciman, in the, in the Twelvers year, you have um, the, the, the concept that the Imam at some point transfigures, um, and in this sense is that there is all a messianic tension and all, but there is alive the the sense of that divine transfiguration that was at the base of the universal creed and especially the military one of the ancient uh, warrior called say paganism that in, in a sense had intertwined with, with monotheism regarding the same meaning which a very few people as we often discuss really know right that actual monotheism is exactly the same thing it's not a copy but it's simply what was the only possible religion existing in the world uh, since ever, and um, and thus uh, were probably more, um, let's say, responsive, even as populations coming from the fringe, if you think about it, to this kind of um, almost, in fact, Neoplatonic exaltation, and this sense of passage from. In, redemption from the darkness into the the light of, of uh, immortality through through hell through the same war um, and I made last year a video about the Balkan heraldry we have seen how prominent the and this is confirmed by the local folklore still today vampirism uh, stories of um, in fact the werewolves and so on w were among populations like I don't know the Serbians, the the, the the Romanians, and other actually areas around, not just the Balkans properly, but in this area between Central and, and Southern Europe, um, the the Transylvanian uh, voivodes had house at this point had in his coat of arms literally a werewolf pointing to the moon and with a cross on the other side. And albeit we don't have actually a rationalized explanation from those times sources about the meaning of the symbolism, well, I think it, it, it's pretty evident, right? It's pretty connected with the idea of the brotherhoods of warriors, of berserkers, of Ulf and Nars. They were actually pretty pretty alive, also in the Slavic world, albeit at some point it was um, too primitive um, uh, to, to document it, and then Christianity arrived before there could be an explanation explicit reference to, to the to the meaning, but it, the obvious reality was that one, because again, all the, the local nobility was pretty warlike and somewhat deeply um, um, soaked into the, the, this kind of ideology. So um, I think that, in a sense, the sultans were tolerating uh, the Tariqa Bektashiya because they understood that it was functional to that warrior ethos, that the Sunni orthodoxy, as a as a universal power uh, necessitated because of the, the aforementioned necessity of the Apollonian of dominating the Dionysian and not eliminating it to risk of its own self-destruction. And uh, because that would be pure sclerotic ideal and no struggle to keep these forces under. Instead, of course, the Janissaries were exactly this. And if you look at the Ottoman army, that's the meaning because the, the Sipai, as we've seen, in the broader historical tradition were the heroes, were the Apollonian superior forces. They were the knights, right? Even Western knights, even though collectively they, they had kind of greater quality, individually said this, these are objectively the best riders, they're best horsemen. Because of course there were also peoples coming from much more step-like backgrounds, right? Uh, maybe, yes, even Romania. even Anatolia, even they were largely sedentary, they, they still were massively influenced by the the Pontic step by this injection of, of different allied uh, peoples, like think about the connection between the Ottomans and the Tatars and so on. Um, the, the winged 
um, troops that we see also among the 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 Hungarian hussars, and then eventually inspired the Polish ones, etc. Th those were the same uh, winged ideology of glory and of angelic slash inferic symbolism that existed ever since, you know, for all the deities um, of victory and of war and of death, as we've seen from the Fravashis to the to the fields and, and etc. Uh, in even in Indo-European tradition. And the Janissaries instead were dirty scum. They were the infantry, the dirt, right? So who fights and and in fact their symbolism, as you know, was all kind of very menial. They had symbols that were connected, say, I don't know, to being the cooks of the Sultan or this other kind of in fact slave function. Because they were as slaves, they were literally captured and kept under, they were lesser people and as such were considered and so they couldn't even afford to had to buy into what was de facto for, for an orthodox Sunni like an heresy, like the uh, the Bektashi one. And this this concept, in my opinion, is deeply important because this is how also how the Ottomans saw their own subjects uh, at large. Of course, they were much less uh, harsh, and as you know, as we will see now, even with Ibrahim Pasha and so on, there were lots. Actually, the Ottomans favored more the Christians than the, ma the same Muslims because, of course, um, in part because just, I don't know, the, the Greeks uh, and other European elements were more advanced uh, as classes, they were richer, they were more educated, say, than the Anatolian ones. Uh, but in part also because of the older idea that a multicultural society can't, in this sense, uh, afford more pawns for the this autocratic regime to to equilibrate um, the, uh, the the wall that is definitely very complicated to keep together in such a extensionally huge um, empire like the Ottoman one doesn't matter whether most of it it's it's actually um, semi-desertic telling the truth so you don't have to be fooled by that but still in terms of population it it, it still includes some some very large demographic pools um, from the same Romania to Anatolia to Egypt and even Syria and, and Mesopotamia and beyond. So there is um, the necessity of co-opting, if you want, even in this sense the most barbaric primitive elements from the Balkan mountains uh, in their in their ranks, right, uh, making them seek uh, some kind of ransom, some kind of redemption which the Bektashi ideology was so well uh, suited for, right? This is the entire history of the, the most successful powers in the history of the world, like the Romans, uh, an ultra-conservative uh, elite, uh, systematically brutal uh, establishment like the senatorial one, that the most noble um, one in the full virile Apollonian patri patriarchal uh, um, in the European root of Roman culture, that fundamentally manages to co-opt the the, the 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 plebs, the vulgus, this this crawling Pelasgian dark masses, and brutally training them to become killing machines like the Roman legionnaires and taking over the world. In the process, uh, the French Revolution, uh, with again this this possessed masses of of peasantry of again coming f straight from the dirt that fundamentally break free as a t titanic force and are brought under the essentially the, the statal uh, and also still aristocratic regime even in Napoleon Napoleonic times think about the resumption of the empire and even they're taking over Europe um, and so there is that th this is uh, a constant also in Western history and you cannot deny that the Ottoman reality uh, was was also basically European um, as basically these people had nothing to do with Central Asians they were th the Ottomans emerged literally from the Bosphorus so these were basically Europeans ruling over other Europeans and just having a different religious ideology for that matter but still fundamentally sticking to the universal standards and rule that you see also in the Renaissance in Renaissance Europe actually being portrayed like the, the heroes, the generals, the noblemen are represented just like the greatest heroes in the Atlantic and in the Roman mythology. They're all beautiful, shiny, uh, 
uh, on horseback and so on. Whereas you look at the Landsknecht, uh, for example, and other, I don't know, the Swiss bike. I mean, these are literally de dirt. They are dictonic masses. They are uh, dirty, vulgar, uh, scurrile, brutal, I irrational, dressed up like, you know, in a disgustingly patched uh, way. But they, they do their job. Right, and that's because they are ruled by a superior elite that knows how to provide them with an authority, with discipline, with hierarchy, uh, with order, uh, and so on. And this is also where our modern, what we call modernity stems from, uh, which is actually just a replication of a universal dynamic uh, that uh, a true civilization must be able to dominate, right? And disasters happen where, when you're either too oppressive or either too lenient, right? And currently we live in the latter space for that matter. And you need to reinforce brutally these archetypal uh, models that are also basically the male and the female one if you really want to have a civilization. Well, in this sense, you had a system who was confronting each other. You know that Suleiman copied the papal tiara and even kind of with different layers so to, sh to, to show us, you know, he was... Yeah, he couldn't wear it because otherwise he would have bro broken his neck, but it was so heavy. But it was just the symbol of the idea that, look, I, I can dominate you, I can learn your ways. Um, and you will learn mine, because there was a kind of a Turcomania. Uh, as you know, in Renaissance Europe, all the princes uh, gifted each other with Ottoman armor and were obsessed with everything Turkish and, and so on. Um, and as you can see in all the Schatzkammer, you know, Central Europe armories and so on. Um, if we're not talking about art and trade, think about Venice, think about uh, the Italian Renaissance, uh, this broader Mediterranean cosmopolitan world that had always remained different from in the various parts, but also in constant contact and somewhat also cooperation, in spite of this parenthesis of, of brutal baths of blood that were the wars either in Central Europe or in the Mediterranean between the Christians and and the and the Ottomans in general because there were so many so many Christians among the Ottomans that uh, it's different it's impossible to make it a, something like Islam versus Christianity in that regard but the difference there is still that Islam was kind of more primitive and traditional in a sense than than Christianity where Christians were leaving their still their, their boom and modernizing and secularizing in the process right and never eventually 200 years of the enlightenment and they're properly the denial of tradition uh, whereas islam kind of also boomed but didn't have the same um consolidated um in fact statal structures that had built over some very specific course of European identities and that eventually having exhausted this moment of great Ottoman expansion eventually had lost everything right because it had in fact acted too much like an authoritarian power and had depleted the subjects of individual force um, necessary to, to sustain the instead the, the the exponential Western growth with colonialism and, and beyond Right, that, that kept fueling the imperialistic aggressiveness of the Euro uh, Europeans, and so keeping their their structures alive and well blooded and 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 oiled in that sense. So, th this is deeply important as a perspective of modern history, my my opinion. Uh, but coming back to the Janissaries, well, they were around five thousand when Suleiman rose to the throne, but um, twelve thousand when he passed away. They were up to the 18th century essentially the terror uh, and also as a consequence the principal reason of European admiration. Uh, also there were some heads of state and military commanders that tried to imitate the, the institutions organizing even the exterior aspect. Uh, the king of Poland at some time had a a contingent of Janissaries on on his own. We've seen it in the in the playlist uh, uh, about Polish warfare and specifically the modern one. Um, the Janissaries. I made a video about their appearance. Right, they were 
they, they typically, not always, but wore an azure cloth and provided with this characteristic um, white headgear. Uh, and they were grouped into four divisions, distinguished each one by their own companies that were the Orthas. And in all in all, the, there were uh, 196, right? Each of which was, uh, at least in theory, made up by 100 men. Um, and for a broader uh, frame, you can look at my, again, Ottoman Warfare playlist. Uh, that, and, and in turn, the Orthas were uh, subdivided in camaraderies, the Odas, instead. Um, however, I'm make, making it very simple, there were mm, several reforms during the 16th and the 17th century, uh, also caused by the repeated revolts of the St. Janissaries that, as you understand, had an enormous power and they, they entered into play in the extremely um, complicated Ottoman succession that literally was, you know, the, the first brother that ran to Constantinople to sit on the throne got it, right? Because that that's how literally the Ottoman succession was. Like, they had a, an actual state in, by 16th century standards, and the center was Constantinople. Very much was just like the Byzantine Empire, in fact. Um, and seizing the throne first was... Uh, the was the race, and so that that's why also they kept uh, the Ottoman's de uh, sultan's death secret, uh, because they they had to give the time to the advantaged ones to run to Constantinople and seize the throne and so on. Uh, and the Janissaries were in Constantinople; they guarded the top cabin and so on. So they they were key to that. So four orders, the sixtieth, the sixty-first, the sixty-second, uh, and the sixty-third, constituted the Solak, that is the guard of honor and of parade, um, provided with this shiny gold hammered helmet. The necessity to favor the Janissaries, but also to keep them busy, militarily, so to discourage strange thoughts about corpse and so on, determined, at least in part, the intense offensive activity waged by Suleiman in the first decade, especially, of his reign. Um, he unleashed immediately, in fact, a Balkan campaign that ended with the conquest of, of Belgrade on August the 29th, 1521, famously enough, and the conquest of Belgrade uh, was considered as the uh, the, the the most negative event in all this period from an intelligent and competent observer such as uh, Oja um, uh, Giseland de Busbeck, who was imperial ambassador in Constantinople from 1554 and 1562. And definitely Belgrade had um, uh, to do pretty much with the memory of John of Capistrano, of uh, John Huniadi, um, and so one of the greatest successes back in the mid-15th century, uh, which was a pushback, actually, of the Ottoman advance in the, uh, on the Danube at the time. So Belgrade, Belgrade the, properly the white uh, fort, was the key, in fact, uh, strategically, to the vast, human, the swampy Hungarian plain. Uh, and from... From, from from this base, the Ottoman armies could swarm into it, as they would. And in the meanwhile, the Ottoman power was moving also on the seas, where in 1522, conquered the island of Rhodes, other dramatic chapter from a Christian perspective. And it was, especially with Suleiman, albeit already Mehmet II second hand, um, in this sense, had a fundamental importance that the the image of the f fierce Turk, uh, that is also, however, mag a magnanimous ruler, uh, emerge. Right. I made a video about the the the, the fear of the Turk, like this, so in the broader imagery of, of the populations that came to be to be devastated by the, the Ottoman attacks. But 
properly the Turk and bought it. Um, but there was also the sense of chivalry that, as you know, was there in the Crusades, was there, you know, this moment of confrontation. And as I was saying before, there was some very much more that the Ottomans had in common with, with, with Europe than, say, I don't know, the Mesopotamians or the, the Persians, um, paradoxically. Um, but for obvious reasons. And, and this image was uh, remembered, for example, by Torquato Tasso in his, in his uh, most uh, famous work, attributing the name of Suleiman to the most intense uh, infidel character in his of the poem, right? And um, however, exactly about Rhodes, the traveler Pierre Bellon that visited it like 30 years after the Ottoman conquest witnessed that the Turks had respected the buildings of the knights of St. John, as you know, that, that was their sea, um, and, and especially their, their painting, right? And th this is an important aspect. It was a way, of course, to win um uh the the defeat that in in a sense that morally speaking that as we were just remembering the universal rule aimed at the conquest of all um the you know the the fidels and the infidels just like Al almanzor captured santiago back in in the day of of the reconquista and didn't uh didn't destroy the sanctuary, the Christian sanctuary, because there was the entire Barian population to win over in that in that struggle. So this was a bit the, the same. Um, and speaking of the Knights of Saint John that had lost their their see the Knights of Rhodes, or as, as you know, as they were also called uh, during their stay in the island, the Emperor Charles V provided uh, them with. Um, uh, the uh, with with Malta with their new base of Malta. In fact, given that the order was also pretty maritime bias, right? So um, the 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 seed of Rhodes lasted for two centuries, and in 1530, after a very uncertain and tiring interval, let's say they were settled finally. In, in the in Malta, and they would stay there for, uh, as we we're remembering for the Egyptian expedition of Napoleon. Therefore, uninterruptedly, in spite of the Ottoman efforts, naturally to, to take over Malta, as well. But today we don't talk about that. We will have to. Uh, between 1526 and 1533, Suleiman, profiting of the quarrels among the Europeans and of the wars that tormented Christendom, that in this sense was not even particularly interested in the specifics of, of the Ottoman frontier entirely, right? Especially Protestant powers didn't give a damn about them. They actually preferred the Turks to, uh, to win uh, than the Catholics. So, of course, the Reformation was a tragedy for mankind in the first place, but it, it showing the, the lack of that sense of universal unity and principle and cohesion. And um, doesn't matter how, you know, the, the church hadn't done enough to, to, to be up to the task, but let's say the, the decline was transversal in the history of mankind, in, in the modernization and secularization of thought as the loss properly of traditional unity and superiority that also in, in, in the appreciation of, of the works um, bears uh, an enormous amount of the Roman imperial, uh, in fact, and uh, European tradition, and uh, that the, essentially the Protestants came to definitely deny, and so essentially canceling any any possibility of resuming their. I mean, atheism was just a step away from that, and that's what it happened uh, in perspective, historical perspective, in, in a very few centuries. Uh, so. At this point, Suleiman launched an energic military campaign between the Balkans and the Danube to crush, especially the um, the sick giant of the time was Hungary, uh, which uh, had, was more like of an empire than than a kingdom, as you know, it was a crown that controlled so nominally 
a very vast amount of territories scattered in Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe, um, and that in this sense had tried to imitate the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine one, and that was trying to essentially resist this broader destabilization of its southern frontier due to Ottoman expansionism, and that instead was essentially demolished, started being demolished, uh, with the Battle of Moach on, on August the 29th, 1526. You see, the fall of Belgrade, August the 29th, Moach, August the 29th, like the, the peak of the Ottoman campaigns, as we will see, um, were, were was always... Um, so, like in September they, they quit because also in Central Europe things start getting worse um, um, climatologically speaking um, and this would play a very important role even it properly for the praxis of Ottoman campaigns for the siege of Vienna that protracted longer right March is very famous because of course Louis II of Hungary was killed in action uh, it was a disaster um, this brought to the the conquest of Buda that was uh, defended by um, a weak garrison provided by Ferdinand of Habsburg that had definitely not helped uh, the Hungarians in time because that's what the Austrians, generally speaking, always behaved like. Uh, Hungary was always a threat to them, so you know, until they weren't destroyed by, by the Turks, they, they wouldn't freak out uh, in turn because they knew they would have been the next, and it's in fact it would be the case. Um, it, it's worth noticing that in this campaign, Suleiman wouldn't keep Buddha occupied. It had actually uh, the, the, its palace, uh, Buddha was the capital of Hungary, so it was, um, or if we can't speak of capitals in such early times, but say uh, its local this palace was uh, burnt and sacked. Also, Suleiman um, seized what remained of what had been the splendid humanistic library of Matthias Corvinus. Uh, the Ottomans were full of of of, of books, of manuscripts, and um, again, very much in still uh, almost an Hellenistic mindset where you store, but nobody reads them, right? Differently from what happened in the West properly. Um, but this importance of, of knowledge preserved, uh, albeit not shared, probably this did create on the longer run some some trouble for the empire. Also had the uh, suburb of Pest, you know, how Budapest yeah. came about, the story, on the left um, bank of the Danube, before resuming the march. And the aim was definitely the golden apple Vienna well, the, the golden apple would have was was Constantinople first of all then would have become Rome uh, the, the the non plus ultra let's say but Vienna was at that point the most operationally feasible target especially after the collapse of Hungary on, on which the Ottomans had to capitalize upon because now this giant had been literally wiped out so this moment you have to seize everything as much as you can before so any other power kind of takes over and maybe with less force but still entrenching in in the periphery of what would still be the in fact the, the ottoman periphery and in fact vienna was besieged uh, during september october 1529 and in the attack to the capital uh, were committed 120,000 men between Janissaries, Sipais, Arab auxiliaries, uh, and insurgents, 300 artillery pieces, which is a freaking lot, uh, and the Ottomans were already pretty much advanced in, in, in artillery. They, they were the ones that for 200 years would dominate uh, artillery technology, especially at this point through the granulation of power before the bayonet was, was introduced. Um, so they had the best of, of it, and that's pretty handy with in siege warfare, given that you have to storm the heavily urbanized and fortified Mediterranean and also Central Europe. So logistically and, um, in fact, uh, polyrsatically, you have to be really very advanced. In fact, the Ottomans really were, and the Janissaries in many ways also were, because as some of this, just like the Roman legionaries of the French, 
um, Grognat, that, that these people were also essentially assault engineers, right, in, in a broader idea, that these were able, crossing rivers, storming f fortresses, um, uh, passing uh, mountains. Uh, so, uh, with all the, the, the enormous logistical problems posed by the same artillery they had to bring, I made a video specifically on this, on this aspect. Well, the, the Ottomans stopped that in, in those times. Uh, in many ways because they were more centralized and they were a bigger power in that regard, but also because they really invested specifically in those, um, in those specialties, let's say. Uh, and in fact, on the occasion of the 1529 siege of Vienna, the Ottomans used an immense caron of supplies um, on the back of 28,000 camels. While Soliman led the terrestrial offensive, by the way, backed by the Voivode of Transylvania, Janus um, Zapolia, that, uh, as you know, would would, draw, would be a, essentially an Ottoman vassal, right? Um, he, um, uh, the old East, uh, as, as I was saying before, like at this point Serbia was conquered, are, are many other powers around uh, in, in the Balkans and Central Europe came to be Ottoman subjects, independently from direct or indirect control that the Turks had in those lands that definitely were pretty tough grounds, especially Transylvania's. So we made a video recently on fight for the early Middle Ages, but s certain dynamics really never change over time. Um, and um, in fact, the, the this Transylvanian leader had been elected as um, King of Hungary by the same Hungarian magnates, because the Kingdom of Hungary didn't cease existing institutionally. It was very convenient for everybody involved keeping it standing, especially for the Ottomans, but also for these other uh, neighboring powers. As you know, there would be Royal Hungary governed by the Habsburgs, there would be the Kraina in between, so this frontier area that would remain during the Turkish Wars as a very interesting uh, zone politically and, and strategically, where also lots of kind of almost step warfare resume, not just because the Pusta is literally the westernmost uh, Eurasian step, but because of the type properly of, of operations that were normally carried out there. Um, so add to that uh, Ottoman starters swarming around, a bit of step spirit that the Magyars had never really lost. And so you have quite interesting tactical solutions, including the aforementioned Hussars that are born here and eventually spread in the rest of European cavalry as a, as a, a say an ethnic specialty and they had a freaking lot in common with the Ottoman cavalry for that matter as well. Um, at this point the Grand Vizier Ibrahim um, was uh, managing uh, a diversive in the western Mediterranean with the aim of splitting European forces that would have otherwise intervene too intensely on the on the central uh, European sector. Now, Hebraim is a very fascinating figure because he was the son of a Greek fisherman of Parga that is a modest village on the coast of Epirus, just uh, facing Corfu. And interestingly enough, for this reason, Ibrahim was originally a subject of Venice, of the Republic of Venice that had ruled there until the Ottomans uh, came uh, around, until when he was very young, was caught prisoner and sold as a slave by, uh, by the corsairs, and he had this luck of being struck for his um, uh, youth and grace, first by uh, uh, a Muslim dame who is a widow um, and eventually by the governor, uh, governor of the city of Manisa which at the time was the same Suleiman 
And when, in fact, he, Suleiman, became Sultan Ibrahim, that was intelligent, cultured, he spoke multiple languages, he was a good musician. Uh, he was very handsome, let's say, and uh, in the meanwhile, he had converted to, to Islam, was essentially welcomed as page in, t in the same Topkapi palace, to be eventually promoted as first falconer, um, and eventually uh, head of the private service of um, the, the great lord and his, um, his favorite, so the Macbul, properly the favor. And in 1523, Ibrahim was uh, eventually uh, nominated as Grand Vizier, and he found himself to be also brother-in-law of the same sultan, um, who in fact granted him his sister Kadija, the same name of Muhammad's wife, in spouse and protected by the mother-in-law uh, Afsa Balide, uh, mother of the Sultan, uh, he was passionate of the history of uh, Greek art. He was in love with the memory of Alexander the Great, that also in the Islamic background of the Ottomans had a huge uh, relevance. And for this reason, however, he was um, so successful, let's say, that there were many courtiers who uh, accused him uh, of essentially of double feelings, like to be a kind of a warm Muslim, if not, um, you know, just a, a hypocrite regarding his faith. And Ibrahim's personal enemy was especially the energetic, charming, and intriguing. Sultaness Roxalan Hurem. I made a video about the Sultanate of Women in which we tell Hurem's history. She was herself actually the uh, daughter of a, a Ukrainian Orthodox priest and she had been raided by the Tartars and sold as a slave and became eventually, uh, because of her beauty, Suleiman's wife, right? And she was a very powerful and uh, capable. Uh, ruler herself, we can say she also uh, interacted with um, with uh, I don't know Elizabeth the first at some point uh, uh, um, through letters and so I mean the, 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 these first ladies of, of Europe, let's say that uh, of the time that had an enormous uh, political prestige, and Ibrahim's power and ambition ended up to with, with ruining him. Right, the, the Sultan, in fact. In the end, had him killed in the night between uh, March the 14th to the 15th, um, 1536, with great s satisfaction of also the, the population of Constantinople that um, was uh, reproaching him this arrogance and transparent sympathy towards the, the Franks, that was the name that it was still used just like in Byzantine times in, Constant in Ottoman Constantinople to call the Europeans in a classicistic, uh, in a classicistic way, right? The Europeans were the Franks still. Um, and there are very beautiful um, stories about Ibrahim. Um, and given his paradoxal destiny, so this almost Lucifer that rises to, to the top as the, almost God's favorite and then falls to the darkest pits, of hell, he, he is remembered by the Turks as the uh, Makbul slash Maktub, that w literally means the beloved, but also the killed, right? And this is a very interesting, it's almost um, uh, uh, an Icarus uh, ant, right? He who wants to fly too high uh, without, uh, say, which is just certain expedients that are not morally adequate to her, will will lose power against um, against the same uh, uh, same reality that he thought he could um, he could defy. Now the events of those three terrible years of Ottoman uh, aggression um, shook Europe and rendered even stronger the scandal of the. Uh, League of Cognac that saw the Pope Clement the 
seventh and the king of France aligned against the emperor exactly while uh, he from the Mediterranean to Eastern Europe was essentially taking on the, the task of protecting Christianity against the infidels. But that was evidently not anymore the time of crusades. Uh, modern modernity kicked in, just as we were saying before. And the same term crusade that um, had had an incredibly short life in this sense, except of being um, eventually revived in uh, in a not uh, not less surprisingly fortunate and as posthumous way in, in the 17th century onwards, um, had eclipsed itself. In fact, in the vortex of the Reformation, because the Protestants. Uh, so, in the Crusades, together with in the pilgrimages, the indulgences, the vo vows, and the relics, one of the fundamental polemical objectives of their anti papal campaign. In other words, the entire idea that the Pope had any power on anything was denied entirely, um, with the consequences, in fact, of actually uh, making the same power of Christianity, uh, Christendom shrinking in those years. And the same ca Catholics from their side uh, would have substituted to the, to the great name that traditionally indicated the, the war to the infidels less intense expressions and also somewhat compromising ones such as in fact the Holy League the holy enterprise and all these things, but not saying crusade out loud, because that would have caused a further attrition with the Protestants, and at some point in the political game of Europe this could not be afforded um, at some point. So, and the siege of Vienna was born, however, under a bad star for the sultanial troops. As we have seen before, usually the Ottoman campaigns in the Balkans were launched um, for a time that was um, spring and the um, the sultanial armies um, left from the say European capital of the empire was Edirne um, in this way it was possible to arrive to the Hungarian plain in summer fundamentally when the uh, ground was less soft and um, muddy and given the average length of the operations retreating before the fearsome and abundant um, autumn rains in, in the region. This time instead Suleiman had moved directly from Constantinople from the, uh, from the shores of the Bosphorus um, and in May, right, in in the mid of May, and it had been possible to advance easily, essentially by sticking to the uh, great majestic Danubian waterway that was naturally uh, r r rising up stream, but this had entailed arriving under the walls of Vienna on September the 25th. And this was also a year of precocious cold and of unusually abundant rains. Uh, even in that uh, cold and humid 16th century and in that area of Central Europe that is already rainy by, by nature. And water, uh, for example, was, was soaking uh, the wet, the, the, the gunpowder, uh, was invading the trenches and the tunnels that the uh, Ottoman uh, engineers and pioneers had uh, rapidly um, established uh, out of the gates of of the Austrian uh, capital. And the operations, the counter-operations, uh, 
of siege went on in the ordinary sequence, right? Assaults, sorties, mining, countermining, um, breaches, barricades. We've seen this also actually for the 1689 siege. The Ottomans, by the way, were pioneering also in, you know, siege tactics and properly um, walls storming with some, in fact, mm. sequence that reminds openly the, the Stoßtruppen one. You bombard the enemy fortifications, you make mind blows, and then you send the assault troops in. And all this had been carried out, except at a slower pace and in a more unpleasant way um, by the bad weather, as you understand, until October the 14th, when the first snow arrived, which for Vienna is, is, is very early, and in fact, again, that year was particularly um, cold. Now, this lesson would have served for like 150 years before the, um, the second siege, and the Ottomans in that long period would in fact have never dared, even though they had the possibility of doing it, uh, definitely, such in depth um, away from their more usual uh, and safer bases. Uh, the distance and the climate had saved Christendom in a way. This is naturally debatable because it's hardly ever the, the weather to, to produce this, but eventually who uh, resists and who who attacks and so how the thing unfolds along that pattern of course the the expedition had been prepared with with, with purpose just uh, yes this this aspect of the weather was surely an important one and unpredictable one by the say the science of the time um, but indeed in fact um, we have to remind that the capital was also saved by the fact these military campaigns um, of the Ottomans were unusually carried out um, in in September and especially after the end of it and it was imperative for logistical reasons spent naturally the uh, the bad season in the winter quarters and so this broader siege was um, uh, w w would have taken more uh, than what had been calculated. Um, furthermore, as we were saying before, to we cannot think that Christendom was saved just by the resistance of Vienna per se. Uh, the same can be said about this event as uh, Poitiers 732 or Belgrade in 1456 or Lepanto in 1571. Um, they were steps, let's say, in a broader struggle that of course so in these events of victorious Christendom um, but let's say even though it's true at the time there was some propaganda and idea uh, reçu uh, that were not looking really at the broader political and strategic reality um, if the Turk had taken Vienna even they had succeeded in it would would not have had the forces or the intentions to go on nor north nor west at that point what what is true, however, is that there was a general relief for the um, for the uh, escape danger, let's say, and the symbolical weight of a uh, not just, in fact, a an Ottoman defeat, but probably a missed Christian defeat, meaning that the Christians realized that they had been attacked up to Vienna, right? So, of course, this victory impacted morally everyone in both ways but the, the Christians were impressed by the fact that literally Central Europe could be attacked uh, by the Ottomans with that ease uh, the gates of Germany and in, at the same time which of course the Ottoman navies were threatening um, Italy and also actually land detachments raiding the Fruiland plain we've seen it in past videos about the Ottomans so um, this was definitely the wake-up call um, that uh, of the many that happened throughout all this time. Um, and in a long perspective, say, in a long term, uh, 
regarding the possibility again that if the Ottomans had wanted they, they could take Vienna right and of course it's a matter of wanting it or wanting it enough and it's a matter also of wanting from the other side not to be defeated um, and surely at the beginning of the 16th century the European cooperation was um, very complicated by the factors that we have that we just highlighted um, but also by the objective um, let's say mm, also technical problems right uh, even the 1689 siege was as we've seen uh, a Christian success for the if anything the, the enormous diplomatic and financial papal work behind it because even at the time it was very complicated especially for powers like in fact the Habsburgs, Poland etc that they were not France they were not Britain so you're talking of areas that had remained fallen asleep a bit like in the Middle Ages like a bit the Ottomans still did so there is properly this concept of Central Europe that we somewhat disregard and don't understand in our historical analysis there is no such thing like like the North and South or simply the East and West there is this important central European dimension that is truly another cultural era of Europe compared to the West um, and it's again I, I don't know what's your historical compass in this regard but it would be very important to to use this notion uh, as a tool as well because um, uh, we hardly see at least I hardly do in popular culture staying here on YouTube etc probably the, the, the deserved attention that such dimension actually owns per se if not in some sort of kind of uh, localistic uh, fanatic sense of oh look they, they talk about my country so I, I, I put a like on this but actually understanding what's broader meaning in European history and tradition of this all also compared to the broader European unity um, I don't see anybody nor from there nor from any other place that actually talks about this and uh, is able properly thinking out outside the box or at least in the broader box of at least a, a European scale uh, culture which there hardly is we, we need badly not just a European Union to become uh, a, a federation of some sort but also a European school together perhaps with a European Empire European army because if we don't understand what what it means to be European culturally so not just because you're randomly born in Europe or even just to, to ethnic Europeans uh, that means that that means nothing that doesn't mean you're European you're just an average idiot you must learn European history but the real one not the one that you think you you can really get from from clickbaits and you know 15 minutes explanations of enormously complex historical matters um, we must habituate kids everyone really and I, I speak of the West in general because that's eventually what we stand for on uh, collectively it, it's dramatically important to have this kind of culture um, I won't digress now on how we see these issues uh, in the world etc but I presume that we can't have anything in practice without this kind of acknowledgement um, and um, um, there was also of course the positive effect Vienna was uh, safe uh, it was successfully defended except uh, the Landsknechts for example at some point moot that had to defend it moot in it because they hadn't received the pay and threatened to sack Vienna in the same exact way the Turks would have done if they had captured a little detail about the story and these were the same people who would sack Rome by the way uh, that had sacked Rome two years before so um, just to tell you what was actually the mindset again of the, of the chthonic scum uh, in, in history in general and made uh, I think abundant videos on properly this figure of the mercenary but of the soldier telling the truth of the average final rank soldier in this kind of late medieval early mid, uh, modern times and beyond because that anthropological awareness is also necessary who are these people are they heroes the guardians of European values and power 
Uh, hardly so. They actually didn't give a fuck about that, to, to be completely honest. Uh, just as much as the, the Ottomans or whoever was within their, their army, including Christians, gave a damn about. Uh, this is a, a universal human constant, by the way. Um, we don't have also to be surprised that if, um, in fact, in, in, on the occasion of such threat posed to, to the city, Christian Europe was not seemingly particularly interested in this ardent uh, crusading appeals that had run the continent on multiple occasions. Uh, especially at the time of the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453, where it was quite impressive. Al also the events of Alternto in 1480, too, that were quite, uh, you know, yet the, the Ottomans land in Italy, except, you know, it was actually the same Italians that were quarreling with each other and let them attack the, the Kingdom of Naples on that occasion, because Florence, I don't know, was kind of probably cooperating this with the Ottomans and all this stuff. So th these things really happen. This tells you how the, the broader political fragmentation of Europe was really an issue, right? Even if at this time we see emerging things like that are, say, loosely, compactly, kind of things like France or Spain, but these, these are still different things on their own, right? There are different states. There are states within state. Think about the Bourbon, the simply sides with the Habsburgs in the Italian wars, um, and, and that had literally a, a major state within France itself on its own. Or, you know, the, the unification of Spain, Bush unification. There were just dynastic sums of the various Iberian kingdoms that remained different states well through the, the modern age uh, that had, in this sense, hardly much uh, in common in the first place. Just the Inquisition had been born at the time of Isabel of Castilla as the only super national tribunal in Spain. Um, so these things are for not talking about the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, Italy and so on um, and as we've seen the disintegration of Hungary this pretty, in fact Balkanized Balkan reality uh, including also parts of Central Europe that would remain a frontier of the, of the Turkish wars for for ages telling the truth um, the fact is that exactly in those years of the siege uh, of Vienna, the year of siege of Vienna, the war of the League of Cognac, as we were mentioning before, was coming to an end. And during this war, um, Christendom had witnessed, among the other things, as we were saying before, to the sack of Rome, carried out in 1527 by the German and Protestant militias of Charles V, even though we should point out that actually the worst atrocities were committed by Catholic Spanish soldiers, as opposed to the German Protestants. Um, and these were troops of Charles V that had, as you know, gone kind of astray, also because they didn't receive pay. Um, uh, and um, the Frunsberg was kind of a, a very heroic, uh, but somewhat um, fiercely bigoted Tyrolean nobleman. Um, and, I mean, these people literally sacked the capital of Christendom. And it was a ferocious one. Like Rome suffered a dramatic blow. But just think about the shame of being like you're Charles V, you are Holy Roman Emperor, and your your troops that are sent there to yes to to punish the Pope in a way. But you know what do they they, they sack Rome, they, they profane the the profanate the churches and so on. I mean, it's terrifying. Because here the the relics were profanated sanctuaries. Um, that were, at, at the end of the day, still manifestations of pietas, even though they were pretty, you know, primitive in, in that regard, according to the uh, reformed uh, sensitivity. But, uh, in a, I mean, in 1527, uh, for Europe, for Christendom at large, this was a, an horrendous sacrilege. Um, it was just barbarity, that there was no civilizational value in the act of that, just a bunch of you know, again, of scumbags sacking a city, in a hell of a city by the way, 
so it is true that the two parts of the conflict by the way that the pope had mishandled this ridiculously as you know he fled eventually the, uh, it was a total mess uh, we will talk about the sack of rome there are also very interesting episodes such as you know the 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 f fight to the death of the swiss guard i mean this man got themselves split open till the last man right in order to defend the pope it, it was fantastic and of course it was there also a, an inter-german rivalry because as you know germany uh, was not in better shape let's say but all the wars that were being fought uh, from the peasant revolt to the other probably one more political ones that were, were all political ones of course but half of germany was protestant half of germany was catholic and the germans between each other since the middle ages we've seen very often hated each other's guts in a way that I think no other European country uh, witnessed, and not even the Italians, that, as you know, were pretty, pretty, um, pretty individualistic minded. And so there was such, like, in a sense, I think this is also a strength. I wouldn't like to get misinterpreted, but the fact that Europe could, could cope with these internal issues um, at the same time tells you how many resources it could spend had it been united against the Ottomans. And this is just like afterwards, like think about, I don't know, after Lepanto, for example, they thought that he could storm Constantinople. And th that was, it wasn't done, but it was a, a possibility. Like the entire political geography of Europe could have been redrawn had, say, Constantinople been captured. I made a video about also the, the Medicean dreams of crusade, the attempt of reconquering Jerusalem. We're talking about the 17th century by Florence. I mean, this kind of weird, um, dreamy fantasies. I mean, the, the, that's that's when the crusade actually had came, as we were saying before, to, to have a new meaning again. It, the 17th century was a much more piously driven, um, or at least spiritually driven count, uh, century than, than the 16th. The 16th was properly the cultural shock, right? Uh, Modern and secular ideologists tell you, ah, it was a shock for the Europeans because they discovered the Americas, the, the discovery of the other. They didn't give a fuck. You know, con 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 Kisar simply arrived in America, began to rape, exterminate, kill, send in, in the mines, etc. They didn't give a damn, right? The only problem there was that that presented also for the Pope and the Emperor a pretty intense issue, and the papacy and the empire worked astonishingly. Charles V, um, the, the courier for discipline them they didn't give a damn about that europeans were safe and and and, and sound from the top of their own mm, cultural superiority they didn't give a damn about anybody what what they were radically and um uh, let's say irreversibly traumatized with as a broader civilizational disaster was the pro the, the, the reformation that was what concerned them it was a universal tragedy like christendom had never split in in, at, in such close cultural terms yes that with constantinople there had been the great schism and all these things but constantinople was was the byzantine it was, it was another thing those were cultures that didn't have a real dialogue with each other since this a very long time this was a split in the heart of the same europe i mean at the end of the century france would be engulfed you know i mean the whole freaking wars of the re religion Germany, at least, was even already all split, divided. But let's say there were huge issues uh, with, with the Ottomans. Again, next door to, to so many countries who have this internal divide. When it, it was of immense disaster. And, and the fault was both Catholic and Protestant, right? It, this is well exemplified by the dialogues also with, between the various cardinals of Luther. Uh, they simply didn't know how to handle the thing, right? They were both wrong theologically. Um, and they were both weak politically, and th this is the truth about it. Um, and the the reformation was completely unnecessary uh, in European history. Like the, the it could, I mean, I've read updated historiography on this, and experts agree on the fact that um, it could it, it could easily not happen had they simply handled just a very few events specifically at the time of Luther better some agreements and some 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 negotiations um we could still live without with, with a single church 
but uh, at least in in a Catholic perspective. So this um, th this is another issue, but we'll perhaps talk about it some other time. Uh, the the reason why the, the the League of Cognac War ended too is that the two sides, as it often happens, were exhausted. They, they were both struck, by the way, by um, a new plague epidemic, by the way. And so they were negotiating at this point because um, it was uh, it was really heavy. And it was the Ottoman seizure of Vienna to have, if not a determinant, but still major role in suggesting the emperor, especially the, ma uh, the maximum flexibility, both in the uh, Barcelona agreement with the Pope, during which it was decided the restoration of the Medician power in Florence, by the way, with the Grand Duchy that would have risen. Uh, and, uh, as you know, there was the shift from the Republic regime to the, essentially, the seigneurial one. And both in the peace of the two dames at Cambrai with the King of France, which was all yet another enormous issue, because, as you know, in 1525, the French king had been captured in battle. Uh, yet another thing, it was source of enormous embarrassment for the Holy Roman Emperor, because at that point it would have been better if you know, Francis had been killed, just as he was being about to be killed. Just, it was just a, a, a German soldier that said, wait, wait a second, this, this is the king. Because also you don't actually recognize necessarily who's who among all these French noblemen. And this man had the, the, the massive bolts to literally have to be the, the kings of France and had all getting themselves almost killed because they were knights first and foremost. And instead they were, they were captured. Um, as you know, it was a slaughter actually of French nobility by the Spanish Germans. Um, but Francis had been captured. And this was an enormous deal. The peace of the two dames is called like this because both kings at, at the same point... Uh, Charles V, because he, you know, had so many kingdoms that he had, he was almost, he had to be present just in once at a time. In France, because he literally didn't have a king at that point, or at least he had it, but he was prisoner, um, was negotiated by these two dames. The Treaty of Cambrai, uh, Margaret of Austria, who was the aunt of Charles V, and Louise of um, Savoy, who was the mother of Francis the the first. Um, as you know, there was this word negotiation. Uh, Francis promised lots of things. Eventually, when he came back to France, he said, no, um, I will not respect this because I was forced under imprisoning. He almost risked also to, to die in, uh, in prison because he got sick, as it often happened. And Charles V was freaking out. He was even at the bed of Francis I when he felt sick just to be there showing that he cared. Because if uh, he had died, it would have been a, a disaster politically propagandistically for, for the empire that had also all these dark issues of the, um, you know, going on uh, overall. Um, so it was a, a dramatic time uh, in so many devastating ways. Um, and uh, the, the solemn incarnation of, in imperial coronation of Charles by hands of the Pope, by the way, uh, had been this consequence and solemn um, acceptation of the reached peace. Um, it, it was um, held thus also, by the way, in the, as sources say, in the Italic land of the empire, because of course, um, and by the way, in a city that, such as Bologna, that was uh, part of the papal states, so this had to stress properly the reconciliation between the papas and the empire, this broader sense of the unity of the universal power. Um, but it was evidently not the case to celebrate it in Rome, where the memory of the profanations of the um, of the Landsknechts was uh, still too much alive. So much that when Charles V visited Rome later on, there was a there were some Roman noblemen that uh, were plotting to to throw him in the I essentially off from the Pantheon Hall, you know, <laughs> uh, the because of, of, of the thing, but, you know, they, they wouldn't do it, and it was better like that, telling the truth. But just for saying how, like, these things had never happened, right, at least in this scale, in this moment, with such already a, a big, after all, statile 
capacity from by these powers to kind of negotiate to try to to withstand this dramatic blows arriving also from the external and in fact Suleiman had not given up while he kept well under control as we will see also in some other video the Mediterranean uh, sector in 1532 he personally came back um, in the theater of the Balkan Wars um, and again with the objective of of crossing um, into into the Pannonian Plain and conquering Vienna again. Um, in this time, the starting date was uh, the w was good, right? Uh, was calculated for the the end of April. Except, and this is how unpredictable war is in front of the modest stronghold of Kozhek, famously enough, defended by a small garrison of the commander of Miklas Yurisic, uh, the um, Turkish military tide was, uh, was um, held off for almost a month uh, between August the 5th and the 30th, so belating dramatically uh, the, uh, the operations uh, for the, the schedule. And when the defenders surrendered, uh, by the way, obtaining a honorable treatment, because, I mean, Ottomans sometimes, you know, burnt and scorched people alive, just, <laughs> you know, as a, as a cute way of dealing with, with, with surrendered enemies. And, I mean, Europeans did pretty similar things, in, you know, in this frontier. Uh, we know of Ottomans being roasted alive and this kind of things, uh, or impaled, because that was not just an Ottoman thing, at least, you know, there was a, a pretty interesting taste in it from especially from the Balkanians and the Central Europeans too. Um, the Sultan, uh, say, faked that that was, um, uh, in fact, a defeat. He said that it was a glorious victory um, that had literally bogged down the entire campaign directed to Vienna that could thus be besieged again. And he contented himself to unleash his troops in fact, in the sacking of the neighboring Styria in southeastern Germany, today's Austria. Um, autumn was near at that time too, and so uh, on the other hand, the greater deterrence was for the Sultan, the news of 100,000 uh, Christians that had uh, rushed uh, around Vienna in order to defend her. There were not really 100,000, but there were enough to to essentially compensate for this uh, delay that it would have otherwise had, uh, according to Ottoman calculations, to besiege uh, Vienna and, and take it, had those guys not existed in Kershek. So these are just random examples, uh, well, pretty famous ones in military history, but still to explain uh, what was the context in which the war against the Ottomans was being fought and how, how relevant it was taking, uh, uh, relevant it was taking the form of, right? Uh, at this point, Europeans began, uh, th that's how much it took. Right, risking literally Vienna to be taken on two occasions um, to realize that this was a real threat that now could not uh, be ignored even within the, the enormous conflicts were agitating Christendom. And even Erasmus of Rotterdam that was usually hostile to every form of war and quite hypocritically so as all pacifists are because they fundamentally don't understand war in its meaning. Uh, but uh, in his uh, Consultatio de Bello Turcico, which literally means the consultation on the Turkish war, I mean the war against the Turks in this case, um, it did not exclude uh, in that specific case the recourse to arms. I mean even for a refined Dutch uh, you know, uh, Renaissance sc uh, scholar and intellectual like Erasmus, like after all, taking up arms against these, uh, you know, these infidels, doesn't sound too much like a bad idea. Um, 
and objectively he was right and and um of course this was the humanist that of course uh, at least understood the, the value of politics and diplomacy that anybody wants to understand war also must take into account at least knowing when to use it when not to use it because sometimes you just have to 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 destroy the hell out of, of whoever you have in front um when the all the other ways would have manifestly been impractical and from his side martin luther considered the turks literally like god's wrath and the um, ex um you know the executioners we can say of ezekiel's prophecy according to which satan would have been uh, unleashed from his own prison which fortunately was not fulfilled on that occasion uh, but luther was you know a pretty as you know interiorly and kind of you know uh, even su seducing and kind of uh, imaginative guy um, in this kind of visions he found uh, very much of his of his liking but definitely that was the the temper of the time right uh, nobody thought that the infidels didn't have to be fought against and that was recognized even by the protestants that as we've seen um, in the lack of a direct threat to their own abodes mostly in uh, in areas that were in fact uh, not ne necessarily away i mean Calvinism, as you know, would spread also in an anti Habsburgic Catholic fashion being in Hungary, being supported by the Ottomans that treated the Protestants sometimes much better than um, than, uh, than than some Muslims along the way, because they knew how precious they were in the struggle against Catholic powers um, support. Um, but they they said, okay, yes, of course, we uh, the Turks are. Uh, seem a pretty dangerous enough to conceive that we have to take up arms except that pope has nothing to do with that if we need to do it we do it ourselves except again most of them would uh, and some of them even sided of course with, with the ottomans um, what is certain is that uh, between the ottoman capture of belgrade in 1521 and in the nevertheless failed siege of vienna 15 29 the map of especially the the balance of of southern and eastern europe had been deeply redrawn um uh, this this was evident right those were the uh, say eastern central europe if you want to um were the new frontiers of the west after centuries of essentially western preeminence on the mediterranean uh, on um, on the entire set of Christendom on the entire continent, right? You know that some areas of the Balkans were redrawn; that would become Muslim during the Ottoman domination, and so on. So, all things that, in, in a sense, still haven't been solved because the Balkan question is, you know, say, hopefully solved in the sense it would not escalate anymore into into the the, viol the ethnic violence that we have witnessed in the past decades. But let's say. Uh, it, the reasons, the roots are, are still there, right? That this is living history that we see at uh, half a millennium of distance. It was the same years, the twenties of the of the sixteenth century, uh, but they are there. It's our history. It's our blood. Um, it's our culture. It's our past. And there is no way around that. So, um, the maritime frontier is worth naturally a, a video on its own i already made a video on the christian capture of tunis that was uh part of the response the most successful response that uh, in spite of the longer term failure um of uh, the christians and especially the southern europeans in the west of the italians of the spanish uh but also of the empire in general uh given that Charles V was at the head of the expedition uh, against the, the Ottomans in the, in the Mediterranean, right? And the creation of a power was garrisoned by Sicilians, by Spanish, um, when the strongholds were captured. And uh, North Africa is also a very interesting frontier in, in itself, because, as you know, the, the Ottomans spread there, but not 
all the ma local Muslims were very happy that there were lots of Muslims that were allied with, with the Christians on that occasion, and they were even fighting against the Ottomans. I mean, think of even about Morocco, but more specifically in Algeria and Tunisia, there were local Islamic leaders that were that the Christians granted to garrison the, the areas because they knew that they, they didn't want the Ottomans there, that they, they, they preferred even Christian influence. So this, this is kind of game that was being played at the time. Um, we will hopefully talk about this topic again for today, soon at least. Um, for today, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.